This is a response to Fede's response to my video, Where is the Past? Um, I have to point out that I'm not necessarily arguing against Benatar's prescriptions or conclusions. I'm just referring to the alleged asymmetry and how I believe it's actually a gerrymander. It's not actually an asymmetry. Um, because, as I say, Caesar did not exist, point one. Caesar did exist, he suffered, point two. Then Caesar did not exist. He's back to where he started at the very beginning. Now you'll notice that this doesn't really say anything about whether or not we should or should not procreate. It's, it's sort of neutral on that. The only thing that it does do, if you ask me, is it refutes the asymmetry. Um, it just says that, yes, you can have an asymmetry if you set the goalposts in a certain way. Um, but, you know, if that's if you accept the parameters from the very beginning that Benatar sets. He talks about uh, potential human beings, their existence versus their non-existence. I guess their continued non-existence versus their existence. Now this is, again, something that's taking place in time. Um, because there is a before and after, or a potential before and after there. Um, or a before and during, actually. He leaves the after out, in point of fact, and therein lies the gerrymander. Um, <clears throat> you have symmetry there. Caesar does not exist, Caesar exists, then Caesar does not exist. Symmetry. I called it originally a finitude suspended between two infinities. Um, now that's an interesting concept, isn't it? How can, you, how, how can such a thing even exist? Uh, where are its boundaries in terms of what? You're only able to judge a finitude suspended between two infinities by itself. Um, if it's a finitude, uh, enwrapped, I guess, as one might put it, inside of a larger infinity, if it is a finitude that is surrounded by infinity, its finitude can only be measured by itself. I think that there's an element of that in eternal recurrence, um, in that every moment is an eternity simply because every moment exists in the finitude of an individual's existence. A finitude that has no measure other than itself to measure itself by. Um, my lifespan is a finitude, and yet the period before and after my life is infinite. Um, in as much as we accept, say, a linear view of time or something like that. Um, but how then can I be a finitude? How can I have a finite piece of an infinity? Uh, that does seem to be a paradox or a contradiction or whatever. Um, but only it's only a, an apparent contradiction when we uh, when we assume that we're using the same yardstick to measure each thing. I know that I'm finite because I will die, and there was a point when I didn't exist. When will reality cease to exist? When did reality not exist? What is reality? <laughs> what is the past and the future? Um, you know, as the, I said in the previous video, O'Brien asks a simple question. You've never really thought about what existence means, do you? <laughs> you never thought about metaphysics. And the metaphysics aspect of it is rather fascinating, as well as this idea of switching from points of view. Again, if I'm going to, if I understand that I'm finite, but I'm encapsulated or enwrapped in a greater infinity, I can measure my own finitude by my own yardstick, but that yardstick is useless when attempting to measure the surrounding infinity or infinities. So you have to sort of approach it on different levels, regardless of whether or not you want to. How can you even think about finity and infinity and measure them in the same way? I don't think you can. I don't even think you can understand them in the same way. 
which means that there are levels of understanding and levels of analysis, or at least um, perspectives. <clears throat> so we have um, the asymmetry, and, and I think that this actually does refute the asymmetry. There is no asymmetry. Um, or there is no absolute asymmetry. Um, it's like saying there's an asymmetry between a one and a two and forgetting all the other numbers out there. Um, you know, if you set the goalposts in a certain way, and that's the genius of Benatar, he sets the goalposts and he gets people to accept the rules of the game early on um, without anyone ever questioning it. Um, he compares pr previous or potential existence to existence, not to post-existence. He leaves that out. Again, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to say he does so maliciously or dishonestly or whatever. Uh, he may actually be convinced by his own argument. Um, <clears throat> but again, this doesn't really say anything about whether or not one, whether or not life is worth living or whether or not one ought to procreate or anything like that. It, it, it seems to be silent on the whole thing. The asymmetry itself is silent um, uh, in its own sort of bare bones. It's just a formula, a formula that can be sort of refuted, I suppose, or at least transcended. Um, now then there's this business of eternity versus temporality or temporariness or whatever, <clears throat> where you have to measure things by a different yardstick. Um, you can't measure that which is infinite using the same yardstick as that which is finite. Um, but the interesting thing is, Benatar does just that in the in his asymmetry calculus. Um, because what he does is, he t seems to take um, a materialistic conception of the universe, and then he starts to dabble in metaphysics without questioning his original assumption of materialism, a strictly material conception of reality. Um, he can't seem to make up his mind which one he's going to be using. Now the reason I say that is he sort of goes for the atheist thing and he goes for the uh, ethics thing and he goes for the suffering thing and he goes for the idea that existence is the only explanation or human existence is the only explanation for consciousness which you need in order for suffering to exist. You need consciousness to exist. Consciousness is, is presumably in his view of things an emergent property of the physical universe. Fair enough. But when he strays into things like the asymmetry and potential human beings, he's going off the materialistic grid. He's then going into a different, a wholly different metaphysical uh, paradigm. He's moving into something that's completely different. Um, he's talking about philosophical constructs. Uh, he's talking about ideals. He, as I said in another uh, video, I think that in many ways his idea of non-existence uh, mirrors the Christian idea of the heavenly afterlife. Um, this world is a paltry place and the only thing that's really worth the bother is what happens once we die. And, you know, he, as I say, he leaves that out in terms of at least talking about the afterlife, but he does imply that a potential human being lives in some sort of ideal. Um, an ideal that is free of suffering. Um, now, where do potential human beings exist? Are they an emergent property of the physical universe? No. So he's stepping outside of his original hard materialistic paradigm. So he's already sort of, he's comparing apples and oranges here already in his basic formula. Now, I don't see that there's anything wrong with that, but what, he's, what he there, thereby has to do is he has to at least point out that this is what he's doing, or we have to take this into consideration when we're approaching what he has to say. Um, I don't 
personally, I don't see uh, hard physicality as is as real as I think a lot of people think it is. And I think that hard science kind of says that hard science isn't as real as we think it is. Um, I don't think that the law of contradiction, or non-contradiction, excluded middle and identity are absolute things. I think that they're useful tools, but I think that they have limitations, and one of the limitations of them are it's, it becomes an either-or thing. Now, if we accept the law of non-contradiction, what are we doing talking about um, hard physicalism, which Benatar does, and in the same the same sort of essay or the same sort of um, book, the uh, better never to have been, uh, he talks about things that exist in some sense outside of that paradigm. How can you how can you sort of square the two? I, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with doing that, but we have to make sure that we understand that this is what he's doing. Now, the reason why I sort of don't have that big of an issue with it is that my view of logic more closely resembles the one that is obvious from my channel's nickname. Um, Syadvada is the, I guess you call it the Jain version of um, Western logic, which sort of is the theory of maybe, or in some ways, or if you change your perspective or your paradigm, things change. Um, and your conclusions change. But that doesn't mean that if you believe A, then B is wrong. It just says if you believe, if you believe or you're convinced by A, it means that you're looking at things in a certain way. But if that doesn't mean that B is wrong, provided you look at it in a different way than you looked at A, then B might be right. Or B might be less wrong than if you were just looking at it from an A-like point of view. And Benatar does this in his uh, Better Never to Have Been. He switches. He switches perspectives. He talks about hard physicality, and then he talks about a completely different metaphysical reality. And he mixes them together in his overall philosophy. And again, it, it's not as if there's something wrong here, but if you want to go with... It, it, the overall picture is, though, he's trying to arrive at a logical conclusion within the paradigm of Western logic. And the problem with that is, of course, Western logic says you can't do that. The, uh, the excluded middle and non-contradiction and even identity say that what Benatar is doing is impossible. Um, if you have to be one or the other. Uh, you know, if, if, there's, if there is identity in an excluded middle, you can't switch metaphysical matrices halfway through the way he does. Talking about, you know, assuming that consciousness is a emergent property of physicality and then going off the physical rails as it were into things like potential human beings and ethics even um, <clears throat> there's an interesting um, aphorism uh, actually in Maxims and Arrows in Nietzsche's Twilight of the Idols I'll just read it here um, it's number 10 it says not to perpetrate cowardice against one's own acts not to leave them in the lurch afterward. The bite of conscience is indecent. And I would say that what, what he's doing here is he's, what Nietzsche is doing here is he's warning you against that. He's warning you against switching paradigms and then assuming that one of your paradigms was wrong. Um, perpetrating cowardice against one's own acts. Well, okay, let's say that there's an act that I, I committed 10 years ago that I truly regret now having done so. I truly regret having committed that act. Should that, should the fact that I committed that act lower my own estimation of myself in my own eyes? Um, it would only really be logical or reasonable for that to happen, for me to think that I'm a bad person because of something I did 10 years ago, if I assumed that I somehow had better information at the time that I did it. When you do something, let's say that, I don't know, I uh, slapped my ex-girlfriend hard or something. I just did something that I believed was terrible. Um, I didn't do that, by the way, just so we know. Uh, but let's say that it, it, I violated something that I now believe to be more or less a taboo. Um, I should feel guilty about that for the rest of my life, should I? Maybe not. Now, I'm not 
rehashing the idea of guilt here. I'm merely saying what happens when you switch perspectives and you, you adhere to non-contradiction in the excluded middle. Um, you're leaving your actions in the lurch afterwards because you're saying, now that I'm older and wiser, I have a better view of what I did and how it was wrong. Therefore, I have the right in my own mind to castigate my previous self for the things that I had done. And by castigating the pre my previous self, I'm castigating my present self. Um, you know, the, the, the point of view doesn't seem to change, even though the actual events and the interpretation and the perspective does change. Um, when I committed that nasty act 10 years ago, it was based upon a, a, a real-time reading of the information at my disposal, and it was based upon how I felt at the time, and all kinds of other things that are not real anymore to me. They're not, I'm no longer subject to the same influences that I were, uh, that I was 10 years ago. So am I, am I really able to pass judgment on my past actions, morally speaking? It's almost like saying, well, it's all very, it's almost like there's two people here. Um, it's all very well, says my past persona, for you to judge me, future. Um, but you're not here in the driver's seat with me anymore. This, you've now changed your perspective. You're outside of what you were when you did this act. And now you're saying that I am bad for doing this, but I'm only doing what seems to be the only reasonable thing to do under the circumstances based on my reading of the information right now. Um, the only alternative to that is, and again, there's something hellish about that, where you're caught in reality and anything that you might do could come back to haunt you 10 years from now. I could be doing something fairly innocuous and butterfly effect wise. I might 10 years from now be beating myself up forever about how, what a stupid mistake this was. But your whole life and every second of your life is a never ending cascade of these things. It's another reason why you might see the moment of becoming is a monster. When you think about the number of decisions that you have to make, followed by another decision and another one and another one and another one and another one, never having complete information at your disposal, you see just how difficult it is to make the right decision. Um, and that's, you know, cowardice against one's own acts. When you're in the stream of consciousness and when you're in the stream of becoming, you do what you can in real time based on the information you've got, based on whatever tools you have at your disposal at that moment. For me to judge what I did 10 years ago assumes that I remember what it was like 10 years ago, it is, and it assumes that I remember what I was actually capable of seeing and, and the, the, um, the judgments I was capable of making. 10 years ago, which I don't have that information anymore. And, or if I, or I don't have the information now, or I have information now that I didn't have then. If we're talking about a linear conception of time and, you know, at the end, the bite of conscience is indecent. Well, there is something fundamentally indecent about that because I'm judging someone for doing what they believed was the only possible thing to do with the information at their disposal and given the present realities 10 years ago. Am I in a position to fundamentally judge my past actions? I don't think that I am. Um, this doesn't mean that we can't act on what when we see other people doing something or when we, um, you know, it, it doesn't mean that we can't actually manage our affairs to limit the damage that we do. But I think that we have no right to sort of pass moral judgment on ourselves or on others. I, I, I in fact, I'd say that it's actually impossible and it's, there's something somewhat cannibalistic about it or auto cannibalistic about it. Because what you're doing is you, you're, Assuming that there is a correct decision to be made, there's an idol out there that you can, or an ideal out there that you can compare every single act to, and you can assume that every, in every given, in any given moment, we have enough information to make the correct, um, correct judgments, judgments to adhere to that ideal. Um, first of all, I not terribly interested in ideals and secondly I don't think that we do have that 
we have enough information at our disposal at any given moment simply because of the insane vastness and complexity of reality and the number of different paradigms it's possible to adopt and it may be impossible not to ab adopt several paradigms at once. Benatar does it himself. He crosses between paradigms right in the middle of a what he presents as an ironclad logical argument. Um, should we say that Benatar is a sneak or a thief or a, a, a shill or a uh, you know, a guy playing a shell game with you because he does this? Maybe he doesn't notice it. Maybe he doesn't understand that this is what he's doing. How do I know what's going on in David Benatar's mind? But he is switching paradigms, and he does it really in a huge way. If you're going to deal in things like morality and um, non-physical realities, I guess. In other words, um, concepts like suffering, uh, concepts like potential human beings, concepts like past, present, and future. You're going to have to at least come clean when you do so and say, I am switching paradigms here. I am switching from a completely physical to a metaphysical um, paradigm. Because again, um, in what absolute sense do all these concepts that Benatar uses actually exist? I'd say that they don't exist. They don't exist at least in a physical sense, even though his original assumptions about the fundamental nature of consciousness and reality itself is fully physical and fully materialistic. If you're going to be a materialistic person, there's nothing wrong with that. And if you're going to be a materialist who switches into non-materialism, um, then you're going to, I think that it, it's, I, it, it's good to at least bear that in mind. And, and it's even better if you actually said that this is what you're doing. Benatar doesn't do this. Um, and this is why I think that, you know, that and the fact that he excludes the, the future from his, um, or at least the ultimate future from his, um, peregrinations or his calculations makes me think that it is essentially a gerrymander, even though it's not, it may not be a conscious one. Um, again, it's just a case of uh, setting goalposts that will, and, and insisting that people remain inside of them. If you accept those goalposts, well, you've accepted them and, and all that flows from them. I don't accept them from the very beginning, or at least I accept them, but only provisionally. Siadvada, the theory of maybe, or the um, theory of conditional assumption, the theory of conditional acceptance or provisional acceptance of axioms or conditional acceptance of paradigms. 